the, the conference. Um, we, uh, we're, we're doing literature today, literature one, uh, and the first speaker um, who, sorry, The first speaker needs no introduction to the, to the home team. He is from the Open University of Cyprus, uh, Antonis Petridis, um, uh, and he's going to uh, speak about a play which I remember once being described to me as, it's about an old man who falls down a hole. Um, uh, that is to say, of course, Menander's Discolos. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to um, welcome Antonis and... Uh, I'll get out of his way. Thank you, Professor Mossman, for the introduction. Good morning to you all. Menander was famous in antiquity for manipulating language as a means of producing a realistic imagine vitae. Quintilian considered the work, of Men the work of Menander to be the best guide a rhetorician uh, would need at cuncta ve praecipimus emphigenda. This, there is indeed much rhetorical elaboration in Menander's plays, which has not gone unnoticed. Scholars have scrutinized Menander's skillful management of various rhetorical devices. Above all, they have verified another ancient observation, especially relevant to this paper, namely that Menander exploits marked language, or indeed the lack thereof, as a tool for individualizing character. That said, Serious doubt is now cast on Aristotle's statement that fourth century tragic characters speak more rhetoricos than their fifth century counterparts. Menander's use of rhetoric, too, is not quantitatively in excess of fifth century pra uh, practices. What makes his practice interesting is that he adopts Euripides' technique of weaving rhetorical, fe rhetorical features deeply into the fabric of his dramatic discourses. Never does a Menandrian character speak rhetoricos in a self-absorbed manner. Moments of heightened eloquence, far from a self-contained exercise of virtuosity or an unthinking concession to the tidegeist, are fundamental for the advancement of the play's themes. They perform an expansive role in the overall semantics of the play, thus they need to be addressed precisely in context. By way of a case study, I shall focus on Cnemon's Apologia Pro Vita Sua in Discolos Act IV, one of the three great set speeches in Extant Menander. Characteristically, this speech is, in, is interesting because, because of the nature of the speaker uh, and the dramatic context rather than for its intrinsic rhetorical value. In fact, what is intriguing about this speech is that despite its, its uh, central role in the play, it lacks such a value in the strict sense of technical elaboration, stylistic polish, or indeed, even practical effectuality. Cnemon's speech does not have the trappings of a consummate, a consummate piece of oratory, like Dowses and Serisco's orations, or Pamphili's decisive intervention in the Epitrebonders, Menander's other great play. Still, it, it, it is tantalizing that the man who lelaliken ideos endovio udeni finally decides to speak. What happens when a logos shy old rustic with an antisocial syndrome who shuns even the most basic human communication finds himself depending on persuasive speech? This would be my central question today. And one should not make light of this question. Knimon is actually a peculiar case of misanthrope as he abandons two, two ubiquitous traits of most literary man-haters. First, he contradicts the adamant refusal to procreate and thus to propagate the despicable human race. Knimon marries and fathers a daughter. Second, by not speaking to anyone, he refrains also from a beloved habit of regular misanthropes, namely to vent angry and, as a rule, articulate tirades at humanity. Knemon's utterances in the play, prior to his, to his apologia, are either short, irate snaps or monologues, like his diatribe against Athenian sacrificial habits. That is, as speech acts, they fail to fulfill the, misanthro the misanthropic tirade's fundamental purpose, which is to bite the listeners. 
So what would one, should one expect when this man, who has choose any kind of speech, let alone the urban as opposed to country practice of oratory, finds himself in need to employ persuasive rhetoric? How is, how is one supposed to read Knimon's Apologia in the context of Menander's Discolos? There are a number of deficiencies in Knimon's speech as a piece of oratory which merit comment. Scholars were once wont to ascribe these deficiencies to young Menander's inexperience as a playwright. This is in fact, I think, uh, short-sighted. In the context of the play, these very rhetorical flaws constitute the quintessence of Knemon's speech. Excellent character touches and the primary dramaturgical means whereby the playwright transforms what otherwise could have been a straightforward palinody into a hotbed of ambiguity directly associated with one of the most puzzling finales in the comic drama we know. As an inexperienced public speaker, violently thrust into the spotlight, Knimon does not know how properly to measure his words for maximum effect. He is constantly negating his own apolo apologia by thoughtlessly, thoughtlessly rehashing the misanthropic views, his misanthropic views while he is supposedly recounting them. He does not avoid on the contrary, he's strongly producing the impression that the single concession he is making is in reality a convenient way out, a way out of an otherwise impossible fix. Finally, and more importantly, when trying to explain the notion, the notion of otakeia, the hallmark of his modus vivendi, he falls into a serious semantic loop which entraps him into what I have called elsewhere a cyclopic impasse. However, it is precisely because the speech is imperfect that it is true to character. And it is exactly its circularity that plays into Menander's overall, overall strategy of presenting this personage not as an irrelevant eccentricity to be done away with, but as the epitome of the play's central questions which must remain hanging to the end. Let us, now, let us now flesh out the traits of Knemon's speech, its rhetorical and other shortcomings, looking at it in detail. The speech falls into uh, the following six parts. Lines 708 to 12, there's a defense of his proeresis and his decision, decision essentially to abide by it, this being apparently his um, uh, decision to live the way he does. 713 to 17, admission of one single hamatia. No one is truly otakes, since no one can live without ton epikurisonda. A man's life can end without warning after all. 718 to 22, justification of his hamatia. Examining people's conduct, he had deduced that personal gain is people's prime motivation and that no true uh, evnia existed among men. He presents his deduction as inevitable given the evidence at his disposal. 7.22 to uh, 29, reason behind his change of heart. It only took one Anir Evgenestatos for him to realize that he was wrong. Gorgias showed him, showed him kindness and mercy despite his own negative attitude towards him. 7.29 to 39, adoption and parengesis. Knimon adopts Gorgias, whether he lives or dies, the latter seems more likely at the moment, all his, all his possessions are now Gorgias's. More crucially, he transfers unto Gorgias the Giriotis of his, of his daughter, uh, since even if Knimon were in the best shape of his life, he would never be able to find a man to his liking. More specific instructions, let me be how I want and take care of the rest as you see fit. Be the guardian of your sister, give her half my property as a dowry, and with what is left, provide for your mother and me, or actually for, for me and your mother. 740 to 47, defense of his tropos, and wish that more people were like him, so that uh, this modus vivendi would become a realistic option in life. Knemon lies down again, giving the impression that his speech is over. Uh, his viiki kameket in mitera gave the impression that he intended to reestablish some contact 
with his family. Yet surprisingly, he now announces that he will be out of their hair, since people will never change their ways and no one in the whole world shares his attitude and belief system. If more people were like him, there would be no courts of law, no wars, and everyone would be content with only what they needed, Dametria. But apparently, people enjoy fighting legal and actual battles. He bids them farewell. So, how does one evaluate Cnemon's speech as a piece of rhetoric? One can scarcely issue a favorable verdict. To begin with, instead of the usual captatio benevolentiae, which in this case is actually necessary, Cnemon commences his speech with a peremptory tone using negative potential optatives, udan uh, is dineto, commanding future, alla sinchorisete, and strong conjunctions, which not only precludes any hope that he can change, but also dissipates the positive impression produced by his concession. Cnemon comes to recognize that vigar ine keparine ton epicurison dai, but his emphatic ala in the next line strongly reasserts contradictorily that his earlier assumptions had actually a reasonable basis. Nobody had provided proof that there is any kind of evnia in the world. His chosen modus vivendi, therefore, is repudiated only in part, and that with a degree, with a degree of uncertainty. And thisos, Imarton. Isos, al along with Cnemon's urgency to justify his acknowledged fallacy, undermines even this small concession of his. He couches his hamatia as an error of judgment due to partial knowledge, not as in tragedy due to a combination of lacking gnosis and a character flaw. That would be, for example, Cnemon's tendency to draw sweeping conclusions. His admission will be further undercut later when denouncing once again humanity, humanity's inclination for acquisitiveness and strife, he indirectly presents Gorgias' behavior as well nigh the exception that proves the rule. Thus, Cnemon's opening to society is practically delimited to this one worthy man alone, confident the emphatic singular of ton epicurisonda. Furthermore, Cnemon is also careless and tactless in the way he speaks, exposing himself to misunderstanding. It is perhaps a minor issue that appealing for Gorgias' care, Cnemon put, puts himself before the lad's mother, the Iki Kame Ketin Mitera. But it is not a minor issue that having raised the matter of the wretched woman, an experienced speaker with a view to painting himself in a favorable light would not have failed to add a few words of apology for the way he had treated her all those years. Cnemon did have such words of apology, but only for Gorgias. He, however, Gorgias, had something to give in return, and this is important. Expressing himself the way he does, Cnemon fails to allay the, the, the suspicion that Toker then, after all, which he so strongly condemns in other human beings, may just be his own motivation here, albeit with a positive side effect for his daughter. Should he survive the accident, Cnemon will need a, car a caretaker, and more importantly, someone to carry out his fatherly obligations towards his daughter, since, since his ethos does not per permit him to. Cnemon's adoption of Gorgias may be construed as genuinely motivated by gratitude and remorse to a significant degree. However, an effective attempt at public persuasion should leave no room for such doubt. As long as he is ambiguous about uh, renouncing his manners, actually until, until 740 he is still defending their logic, after that he goes a step even further, decrying the fact that more people are not like himself, Cnemon cannot but give the impression that having been crippled, uh, but not having changed, he, uh, by adopting Gorgias, he is looking for somebody convenient to shoulder the responsibilities he himself has failed to fulfill. Above all, however, Cnemon's speech is undermined by an obvious circularity created primarily by the vagaries of the philosophical term around which the speech revolves, namely otakeia, self-sufficiency. Otakeia is supposedly, supposedly renounced in the first half of the speech, but Cnemon knows not when to stop for good effect. 
Ironically, he spoils his partial and ultimately illusory re re renunciation of, the, of Otakeia by saying something unnecessary and excessive exactly when he professes his reluctance to say ton anangeon pliona. You see the irony here. Unsurprisingly, this is precisely the moment when his cyclopic impasse, as I call it, comes into full, full effect. Prior to the Apologia, the play had invested heavily on building uh, the misanthrope into a beast. Apanthropia, the thematic term whereby Pan, already in the prologue, circumscribes his character, equates inhumanity, a state of emotional numbness, with non-humanity, the ambiguous ontological grounds shared by the divine and the bestial. Knimon is seemingly apologetic for his beastly, autarchic ways in the uh, beginning of the Apologia. But his true goal, it, it transpires, is not to renounce Otakeia per se, but to claim a new meaning for this ideal founded on um, <clears throat> moderation and simplicity. Echondan metria ekastos igapa. This is, in fact, the scenic version of Otaki, emblematized by Diogenes himself and before him, uh, partly by Socrates and Antisthenes. It originated in the ideal of an ascetic life of meditation, which met, met needs by limiting need. Otakeia for Diogenes meant uh, contentment with the bare necessities of life food, shelter, and clothing of the meanest sort. The misanthropic traits of Knimon overlap significantly with Diogenes the dog's traditional image, at least to the casual observer. He lives on the bare essentials. He seems to have only one bucket and one matzok. He leads a dog's life by reducing himself to tasks unthinkable for an Athenian citizen of some standing. He is wild and ferocious, snapping at people and decrying their ills. Like Diogenes, he opposes traditional religious practices, if not religion at large. He is specifically likened to a, to a dog by the cook's icon, albeit in a proverbial context, whereas Getas, the poor, unsuspecting slave who comes to his door, sees him as a fierce canine guarding the, thresh, the threshold. Midakis, do not bite me. Until the accident, Knimon confess, uh, till the accident, Knimon confesses, his philosophy of life was not dedicated to the reduction of material need. Mistakenly so, it embraced the fantasy that he could overcome the irritating imbecility of human nature, which renders the appeal for help inevitable. This distorted ver version of Otakia, which he is supposedly renouncing, uh, uh, Otakia as total self-reliance corresponds not to Diogenes, but to another famous Otak, the sophist Hippias, or at least his platonic persona. In Plato's Hippias Minor, the sophist gloats that he has become self-sufficient by maximizing his capacity to meet an ever-increasing uh, amount of requirements without recourse to external backing. He has learned every skill and craft and can perform every conceivable task. The sophistic idea of Otaki elevates the individual above the communal and puts strain on the foundations of classical society itself. The literary incarnation of this idea, of course, predates the sophists. It is primarily the Cyclops Polyphemus, whose clear echoes in the Discolos have been recognized. For Polyphemus, the most cyclopic among the Cyclopes, self-sufficiency uh, self -sufficiency is perceived, perceived in terms of might. The Cyclopes do not take any heed of Zeus. They are, that is, self-sufficient because they are polyferteroi. Polyphemus' buffoonish Euripidean counterpart gives this, view, gives this view a sophistic, sociopolitical, even economic twist. O plutos anthropisque tis sophis theos. This, Knimon finally understands, is impossible. Now that he knows better, he seems to be claiming his right to stick to Otakeia in its positive, cynic guise, to denounce a cyclopic slash sophistic self sense of self-sufficiency in order to be allowed its cynic correction. Yet, let, let us look at Discolo 742-46. I want to say, says Knimon, I want to say a few words to you in support of myself and my ways. 
If everyone was like me, neither would there be courts of law, nor would they drag themselves to prisons, nor would there be war, but everyone would have what they needed and be content. Compare this with Odyssey 9, 1, 12, 1, 15. They, the Cyclopes, have neither councils making decisions nor laws. Instead, they reside on the top of high mountains in well-shaped well caves, and each governs their children and wives, and they pay no attention to one another. The fantasy world Cnemon describes in Discolo 742-46, at the peroratio of his speech of all places, for, falling into the trap of saying, ton anangeon pliona, is exactly the world, the world of the Cyclopes. In a circular fashion, with his final daydreaming about a society with no digasteria, i.e. no laws, themistes, and practically no human interaction, each, each individual keeping to himself, Cnemon unwittingly regresses from Diogenes back to Polyphemus, from the cynic sage back to the beast, at the moment when he came closest to rejoining the society of men, his speech aimed for a scenic getaway, but ends up jumped in a cyclopic impasse. It is a token of Menander's rhetorical art that Cnemon's rhetorical, rhetorical impasse is evoked also by the blocking of the scene, namely by the position of Cnemon's body on the echiclema. Take notice of the following. In 691, Cnemon, Cnemon enters lying on the echiclema. This is the nearly fatal result, or result of his isolationism. He asks his daughter to help him stand up to deliver the part of his speech that he's supposed to resurrect him to society. He invites her to help him lie down again right before he reverts to the kind of rhetoric that stretched him on the couch in the first place. In the final scene, in the finale of the play, Cnemon is lying again on his back as the two slaves are bullying him. The implication that his fate in the finale results from his obstinacy in the apologia is, I think, inevitable. Being circular, Cnemon's speech fails to be either redeeming or effectual. None of his apparent rhetorical goals seems to have been reached. The fact that the spectator is left confused about the, uh, what these goals are is a major part of the problem, of course. What is Cnemon trying to do with the apologia? If he is apologizing, his apology is self-negating and potentially self-serving. If he's justifying his modus vivendi, he fails to cast off the mask of the beast. If his objective is to be left alone, he appears successful. Nobody responds to his argumentation, just as well he hates to be spoken to. The company bid him farewell with a strong closural gesture, hereto, a Miss Eomen. Yet their leaving hardly feels like a triumph for Cnemon, who has failed even to properly to explain, let alone vindicate, his life's choices. The audience is left with a bitter taste in their mouths, knowing that this cannot be the end uh, of the story, and yet also knowing that a regular comic punishment scene can no longer produce a sense of true poetic justice. Why? Because the final analysis is the following, and I conclude with this. Completely in tune with the nature of the character, Cnemon's speech is marked by its very unmarkedness. Daos and Siriscos' unnatural eloquence is a comic, in Epitrebontes, is a comic fabrication allowing the audience humorously to glimpse the tragic sub subtext behind them. Cnemon's rhetorical uncouthness is what one would expect from a near aphasiac hermit of a man. The rhetorical shortcomings of the speech are part and parcels of Menander's design. The same goes for the speech's double ecvasis. The speech does not persuade as to the merits of human isolation, but it does succeed in humanizing Cnemon just as much as it was needed for the meaning of the final scene to be desperately compounded for the audience. The apologia has distinguished the old man from the ordinary comic villain, whose suffering in the end is usually received with light-hearted schadenfreude. After this speech, the slaves' merciless cry in the end, let us tame this beast of a man, 
cannot but be problematic. Thank you very much.